discussion of the ECDP lecture series featuring the private sector. For the benefit of first-time attendees, the EDDP organized the lecture series to gather energy experts and practitioners from government, the academia, and the private sector, and provide them with a neutral platform to exchange ideas and insights on the sector. This lecture series also supports the short-term and long-term capacity building program of EBDB as it aims to provide a holistic understanding of the country's electric power industry. After hosting lectures from representatives of the government and academia, the EBDB now aims to provide perspectives from the private sector. Our lecture this afternoon is in partnership with Morocco Powergen Corporation. The lecture is entitled Optimization of Supply to be presented by Mr. Trisogonus Herrera. Mr. Herrera has, o has over 40 years of experience in the Philippine power industry and is currently the Senior Vice President of Commercial and Planning of Meralco Power Gen Corporation. He has previously worked at the National Power Corporation from 1976 to, to 1992 where he held various positions in operations, economics, and finance and became NPC's youngest ever Vice President. He joined the private sector in 1992 and from then was involved in the development of generation projects, indigenous coal, other infrastructure projects, among others. His areas, of, his areas of expertise include utility finance and economics, power origination and marketing, power system operation, development of private sector participation in power generation and distribution, financial planning and analysis, and risk management. Mr. Herrera graduated from Makua Institute of Technology with BS in Elec Electrical Engineering. He has also a Master's in Management from the Asian Institute of Management. The lecture will run for 40 minutes and will be followed by a 20-minute open forum where questions from the audience will be entertained. Kindly note that the presentation content and the opinions of the lecturer do not necessarily reflect that of EBDP, USAID, and the UPICON Foundation. Without further ado, we give you Mr. Krasonga the server. Thank you and uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm happy to be here. I have the moral support of uh, my wife and my son. So that gives me confidence, if not fear, from the wife. If I will embarrass her in this lecture. <laughs> but my wife is an alumna of your school. And my, I learned my economics by osmosis. Uh, I, I will cover these following topics, and it will span a period of four decades in the past, and maybe two decades into the future. Uh, we need to look at the past so that we understand where we came from and where we are today, so that we have a better perspective of where we want to go and how do we get there. We also uh, need to ask some other questions or some deeper questions of uh, why and what if. The Marcos policy on uh, energy security, which was triggered by OPEC, spawned what we have today. Its twin pillars are energy autarky or self-reliance and fuel diversity. The plan was to reduce oil dependence and to achieve energy autarky or self-sufficiency or self-reliance by developing indigenous energy sources such as hydro, geothermal, and local coal. Malampaya came in much later. As we reduce oil, we will pursue fuel diversity from a balanced supply mix of hydro, geothermal, coal, and nuclear generation. Administration succeeding Marcos practically adopted the same trust, except the nuclear option. This generation chart shows what happened from 1979 to 2016. The 37-year period saw salutary achievements in energy security. Energy generation grew at 5.2% average annual growth rate. Generation capacity increased eightfold, mostly under the auspices of government capital, sovereign guaranteed debts, or government performance undertakings. But Ipira will 
later change this. There is a doggedness in displacing oil. Its share dropped from 75% to 6%. Energy ultimately increased from 25% to 45%, reaching a high of 69% in 2008. Along the way, we became the second largest producer of geothermal energy in the world after the USA. We developed several large hydro plants. Notable among others is MAGA, Southeast Asia's first large multipurpose dam. We also developed Malampaya, a 2,700 megawatt deep water gas to power project and one of the largest industrial endeavors of the country. We have a high share of renewables at 35%. Renewables share crested at 56% in 1985, the year which saw tremendous gains in hydro and geothermal energy development. This is the uh, generation mix chart, which clearly articulates the reduction of oil, energy autarky, and fuel diversity. We saw two major laws affecting the power industry. We are charting the future directions of the power industry under these two important laws. Following IPIRA, most of the capacity in the main grids are now in the private hand, except for about a fifth, which remains with Pisan today. We also saw RA 9513, or the Renewable Energy Act of 2008, which is driving development of variable renewable energy such as solar and wind. Over the course of four decades, we achieved the policy objectives of security of supply, or reducing oil dependence, achieving high self-reliance, and a balanced energy mix, and incidentally, uh, also delimiting our carbon intensity in generation. Unfortunately, the results came at the price of paying one of the highest rates in Asia because the government did not provide any subsidy of the more expensive generation mix which replaced oil. We also underwent premature deindustrialization because high rates cannot support manufacturing. Let me elaborate in this next chart. This chart locates some countries relative to their per capita kilowatt hour consumption on the Y axis and per capita GDP on the X axis. I overlaid the GDP kilowatt hour points with a bubble to reflect the relative scale of power rates. Despite having the lowest per capita GDP and kilowatt hour consumption, we pay high power rates comparable to Singapore and Japan, which also does not have government subsidies in power. High rates is a chronic problem which has festered throughout the history of the country's power sector. In this next chart, I will attempt to show the impact of high power rates to our economy. This chart tracks GDP on the y-axis versus on the x-axis the ratio of value added in the GDP of services and the value added in the GDP of manufacturing. A ratio of one in the y-axis means services and manufacturing have equal contribution to the GDP. This is the dashed yellow line. A ratio of more than one means the service sector has outpaced manufacturing. In a sense, the track reflects the balance between services and manufacturing. The more balanced services and manufacturing are, the nearer to the yellow line the track will be. When services is growing faster than manufacturing, in effect, the industrialization is happening. The track veers to the right of the yellow line.
Countries where services have not rapidly outpaced manufacturing are able to achieve bigger and faster growing GDPs. We see this in Malaysia, Thailand, and China. The Philippines stand out for its track. It suggests that services has quickly outpaced manufacturing. And the reason I can think of is that high power rates do not support local manufacturing, the local manufacturing sector, which otherwise could have contributed to a higher GDP. Our economy needs to work, indeed to run, on the two legs of services and manufacturing to catch up with our neighbors, and hence the need for our power rates to be competitive to support industrialization. In this chart, I track <coughs> CO2 per capita and GDP per capita. We are at the bottom. We are the bottom track in this chart. We, it is evident that other countries achieve higher GDPs at the cost of higher CO2 emission. We can add another layer of information by showing a bubble at the terminus of the tracks to reflect the carbon intensity in GDP. Carbon intensity in GDP may be regarded as the measure how much pollution is produced by a country's economic activity. We thus raise the question, should we further reduce our carbon emission when we are we already have the lowest carbon intensity in GDP among the group. Compared with our neighbors, our problem is in the paucity of our GDP and our kilowatt hour consumption, and not in the surfeit of our carbon dioxide emission. We need to grow our GDP so that first, we catch up with our neighbors, and second, so that we will have the resources to deal with climate change. How do we grow our GDP? We need a future that unfolds in a regime of low power rates. At this point, please bring me to pause and uh, to bring up three key points to provide further context in what I will be covering about the future scenario. The first key point is that IPIRA unlocks the door to the pathway of a lower power rate in its transformation of the power industry from a seller's market under a government monopoly in generation to a buyer's market. DUs and contestable customers are empowered with competition and choice, the decision from whom and what to buy. The radical reforms of the IPIRA include the government's exit in generation and transmission, the creation of a wholesale electricity spot market, and the implementation of retail competition and open access. And there is no going back in the period. It is a toothpaste already out of the tube. The second key point is that about 60% of the country's operating power plants are older than 15 years. A typical power plant will last 25 to 30 years. So as plants get older, we shouldn't expect them to do heavy lifting anymore. The future presents an opportunity to replace them if they are no longer competitive in the West End or no longer environmentally compliant or they cannot comply with the resiliency standards that the DOE may impose. The third key point is that competition can only mold 50% of what users pay for power. Gains that may be achieved in competition in a competitive generation sector may well be offset by bad regulation and policy. Now we talk about the future outlook. In past market outlooks, the Rato Power Gen engaged 
uh, Poiri and the Lantau Group to provide market studies under the following forecast boundaries. First, to meet the forecast demand based purely on least cost addition of plants. No priority for indigenous energy and no target generation mix. Second, to have the maximum variable renewable energy, the system can absorb without fit by admitting these BREs when they achieve parity. In a sense, these are your optimization boundaries that went into our market output. We are now fully capable of doing our forecast following the same forecast boundaries. And I am pleased to share with you the results of our uh, analysis. This chart shows our forecast of supply capacity and demand. Average annual growth rate for demand would be about 4.3%. That, that will be shown by this black line. And the dust line is the level of reserves. If we let the market work and the buyers do the choosing of suppliers and the repair, the market would unfold in the least cost part. Because the market will choose the, choose the cheapest energy source, we'll have a big share of coal. Because at grid parity, they become competitive, and least cost forecasting admits the maximum solar penetration without subsidy will have high solar penetration. Generation capacity will almost triple from 2016 to 2014. With VREs and coal, it's accounting for a third of the capacity by 2040. This chart shows a forecast energy generation. Because coal is cheap and available 24-7, it will be the bulk support for baseload. Existing gas plants continue operating after Malampaya is depleted because they can supply mid-layer with LNG. Solar generation will match the combined generation of geothermal and hydro. This is the forecast of spot prices, which gives us a sense of a lowering, if not some stability in market prices. We expect spot prices to fall in the near term and to trend towards an equilibrium with the long run marginal cost of coal over the long term. Connecting the past with the future outlook will make the story of the power industry have three chapters. The first tells of a breakaway from dependence on oil because of OPEC. The second tells a story of a strong energy security built on indigenous and conventional renewable energy. But it is paid dearly with one of the highest rates in Asia owing to the lack of government subsidy. And the third would tell a story of how we would deal with the problem of high power rates using cheap and reliable coal and variable renewable energy. We are now at the opening pages of the third chapter. Because we would need to import a lot more coal, we would give up the gains we achieved in energy alternative. We would also see an increase in carbon intensity in generation. Larger solar penetration data, when they achieve parity, would tend to cap it at around 721 tons per million kilowatt hour. Market forecasting is very daunting because there are factors that are really big looming issues 
which can greatly and quickly change the future. <clears throat> we need to ask these questions. What if we deviate from the least cost expansion to comply with the Paris Agreement, COP21? What if solar and battery prices drop faster and deeper? What if we can get gas cheaper? These questions remind me right perhaps like of a Yogi Berra quote, the future ain't what it used to be. The trade-off in achieving low power rates is more CO2 uh, emission. What if we deviate from the least cost expansion to comply with the 70% reduction commitment under COP21? Then we would, we would need to bring down our 2030 carbon dioxide emission from generation by about 82 million tons. The next chart shows the raise of cost in reducing 82 million tons. This shows the cost in billion pesos of deviating from this cost generation to comply with a target reduction in CO2 emission in generation. The columns show the uh, percentage of reduction and the rows show the cost. <coughs> It would cost 102 billion pesos to attain a 70% carbon dioxide emission reduction in generation in 2030 if the cost of reducing or avoiding CO2 is $25 per metric ton. And that's the estimate, I believe, of the global social cost of carbon. Our compliance should be cheaper than the social cost of carbon, lest we exacerbate the problem of high power rates. <coughs> Consumers should not bear more than 63 pesos per kilo, 0.63 pesos per kilowatt hour, so that the fuel would not be worse than the disease. If the social cost of carbon for the Philippines is 5% of the global social cost, then consumers should not bear a rate height of 0 0.03 pesos per kilowatt hour to comply with COP21. There are many non-carbon or less carbon-emitting alternatives to coal but they cost more. We can calculate the extra cost in terms of US dollar per metric ton and take it as the price paid for the benefit of zero or lower carbon emission. Thus, we can benchmark against the social cost of carbon. When translated as a cost of removing carbon emission, the higher cost of geothermal and impounding hydro, as well as solar and wind under feet, all exceed the social cost of carbon. Using them, therefore, would be tantamount to taking a cure worse than the disease. The figure for nuclear looks good, in fact, even sexy, but I haven't included the terminal cost of retiring the plant and safekeeping of the nuclear waste. By the way, some of these alternatives are the same suite of options in complying with the renewable portfolio standards. If the purpose of the RTS is to reduce, help in reducing harmful emissions, then let us be very mindful that costs do not exceed benefits. For the VREs, grid parity looms with the rapidly dropping capex at which, at which point they become viable without fit. The fact is, we don't need to support BREs with fit anymore. Considering that just recently, Miranto signed a solar PSA at 4.69 pesos per kilowatt hour, 
with an equivalent carbon displacement cost of about $18 per metric ton. Now we go to the impact of solar. This chart shows the the union generation mix for 2015 for Luzon. Gas and coal are dominant baseload suppliers. That's the blue and the red area. Gas operates as baseload because of fuel take or pay from Madam Pine. The VREs or the variable renewable energy have a very small contribution in 2015. The yellow line shows the Western price. It has three pronounced peaks, which coincide with the demand peaks. Off peak prices also happen during off peak hours. This next chart shows the, the urinal profile for 2030. It is very different from 2015. Coal supply becomes more dominant. Without a fuel take or pay, gas operates as mid merit mostly in the evening. What is significant is that high solar contribution will disrupt supply and the Western price. During daytime, solar displaces oil and gas and lowers prices. This will result in one pronounced Western price peak and a, low, a longer span of low prices. There will be price arbitrage opportunities. Our forecast does not include storage of solar energy for nighttime generation. We also made a very conservative assumption on solar penetration or behind the meter application of solar. What makes solar and batteries very disruptive, disruptive is the scalability anywhere, behind and in front of the meter, with sizes for households of some kilowatts to distributed generation scale of some megawatts and in utility scale application in the hundreds of megawatts. But we cannot ignore the tremendous incentive because of green price arbitrage and the very rapid and sharp drop in capex of solar and batteries. I'm afraid forecasting solar share is a perilous job. But it can happen even more sooner than later that solar starts displacing the mid merit and peaking need for oil and gas. What if we could get gas cheap or cheaper? Then we cannot ignore the vital role gas generation has in lowering rates and in reducing carbon dioxide emission. This chart shows the gas parity price in US dollars per million BTU between a CCGT plant versus a supercritical plant at various coal prices and capacity factors. At capacity factor of 80%, which is more or less the base load operation, and at the current range of coal prices of between $65 to $95 per metric ton, the all-in gas parity price would range from about $7 to $89 uh, US dollars per million BTU. In addition to price, however, gas must surmount the challenges in volume and destination flexibility and capacity scalability to be able to aggregate or secure anchor PSAs, especially in a CSP regime. On the other hand, it would be tantamount to making consumers pay a subsidy, if not ready if government sets a policy that compels end users to buy gas generation <coughs> at gas prices above its coal parity price. 
At this point, we can evaluate 